All right, hello everyone. This is Tommy Valentine with Historic Athens. We wanna thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of This Moment in History, COVID-19 in Athens, Georgia. Uh, today we are speaking to Jessica Rothaker from Heirloom Cafe and Fresh Market. And we're really looking forward to having a very special conversation about uh, not only Jessica and uh, the wonderful operation they have at Heirloom, but also how specifically living through this historic era has affected how they do business and their relationship with the Athens, Georgia community. We do want to begin by saying thank you to our weekly sponsor. Uh, this is an 11 week series, 55 episodes every weekday at one o'clock. And each week has been brought to you by a different generous local sponsor. Uh, this week has been Karen and Norman Baldwin. And so we really appreciate Karen and Norman, both uh, members of our organization, but also people that took it a step further by supporting our ability to explore and document this moment in Athens history. A little later in the program, uh, in about 30 minutes or so, we're going to thank our annual sponsors. And uh, as a note for today's broadcast, uh, Heirloom is actually one of those sponsors. Uh, we want to make sure that we lead up front by saying that we appreciate the work that Heirloom is doing and, and their support for the historic community. Uh, they were selected today, though, because they represent a very special crossroads for part of our community, for folks living in the historic Boulevard, Cobham, um, Newtown, Pulaski Heights, or Prince Avenue area. Uh, Heirloom is really a community place where people come together, and that's really been difficult to do during these times. So we're really looking forward to uh, this discussion. So uh, without further ado, what I'm going to do is go ahead and bring our guest on the program. So bear with me as I make that switch. So one moment, and we're going to bring Jessica on. All right, great. Uh, hi, Jessica. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate being able to have this conversation. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for, for letting me be one of your guests. I'm really excited about this project. It seems like a really special thing to do. Well, thank you. You know, uh, I'm sure what I'm about to say is true for you too, but like every other organization during this time, you know, we're just trying to find our place in a world that has gone crazy. So I know that, uh, that that's true over where you are. Um, so uh, Jessica, I know to a lot of our viewers, they're, they're already familiar with Heirloom. They may be familiar with you personally, uh, but if someone hasn't been to Heirloom Cafe and Fresh Market, will you tell us a little bit about what makes your restaurant uh, unique? Sure, yeah, so um, we are a family business. I am partners with my father, um, Travis Birch, with this mm -hmm. restaurant. We opened in 2011. Um, our mission is creating community, celebrating local farmers and telling story through food. Um, so we are a Southern inspired um, farm to table neighborhood restaurant. Um, we usually seat about 80 to 85 people um, when we can have normal capacity and it's, um, in the middle of the Boulevard neighborhood at the corner of Chase and Boulevard. And um, we work with a lot of local farmers to supply our produce and our meats. And we just try to provide really good food where people can come together in a comfortable environment and enjoy themselves and create community and just have a good space to do that in. So that's our general idea. <laughs> that's right. Now, Jessica, you're... Uh, business, in addition to supporting historic things, is a historic thing. I, you actually won an award uh, from us when we were previously at Athens Clark Heritage Foundation, I believe, uh, for your work to uh, renovate and rehabilitate your current location. Uh, can you tell our viewers what it was before it was heirloom? Yeah, so originally it was an Amico station um, and a service station. It was built in 1960. And um, so it's kind of just on where the historic area is for, mm -hmm. for that neighborhood. It's a little bit later of a building. It was actually built on two lots that were Victorian um, homes before they were torn down to build this gas station. And so wow. we have kind of a strange little L-shaped lot where we have a long skinny lot and then a square lot on the corner. And then um, it was a service station for many, many, many years. And then... Um, when Amico and um, Shell merged, I believe there was a sh there's a Shell across the street from mm -hmm. us, and so the gas station was closed. It sat empty for about ten years, and then um, our landlord Jimmy Wilfong purchased it, and he had a um, another service station type thing in it. He um, they were 
Adelaide and Omala. I always feel like I say that wrong. And now they're yeah. out on um, 441, but they were in the neighborhood and would work on people's cars. And the, the parking lot was pretty full of cars at most times. So being in the middle of a residential neighborhood, that wasn't the ideal setting for that, but it is what it was. And then we came in in... Um, I think we signed our lease at the beginning of 2011 and renovated the property into a, um, a restaurant. And that's what we have. But we tried to keep a lot of the details from the gas station in, mm. in the design. So we have a garage bay that we can open when the weather is nice for our dining area. And we have the same horizontal lines from that garage door that go across the whole front of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, we did bump out the area that was the office of the gas station originally and have our espresso bar seating area in that space. Um, but it's still kind of contained in the same way that their office was. And then our kitchen is in a back storage area and work area that they had in the, the restaurant. So, or in the gas station, they were in the restaurant. <laughs> One thing I want to ask you about is I know that, you know, this becomes really apparent as soon as you visit heirloom. I know it was something my wife and I commented on, uh, when we had the first of what turned out to be many brunches at Heirloom, uh, is that Heirloom also has a, a, a strong commitment to local arts and artists. I know that, you know, if I go, if I went once a month, I feel like almost every month I'd see a different artist featured and not only as a gallery space, but really promoting, uh, I, I think, a responsibly priced uh, ability to support local artists by purchasing the art. I, I see a lot of emphasis on that. Can you talk about Heirloom's relationship to art and artists? Certainly. Um, so we've had several different people that have curated the art at Heirloom during the time that we've been open. It's probably been about four people. Um, the first few of them were employees of ours that were also artists and just had a lot of connections in the arts community and would reach out to their friends and their connections and get people in. Um, it's currently, the art is being curated by my mom. Her name is Susie Birch. Mm -hmm. She is a local painter and her studio is actually next door to us on Chase Street. So she um, she puts the artists together. We do every other month, we switch out the art and mm -hmm. um, we don't take any kind of a commission or cut or anything. We just want the artists to be able to sell their work and um, and be supported. and. Sometimes they've done it in relation to a charity where they've given a percentage of their um, their their sales to that charity, and sometimes they're just doing it on their own. It's everyone from like college students that are just mm -hmm. starting out to some more established artists. And um, the last artist we had in before we had to close down for COVID was um, Jess Dunlap, mm -hmm. and they also go um, as their artwork by Possum Wood Arts and have a lot of really cool line drawings and a lot of kind of nature, plants and animal inspired work that really worked really well in our space. And so a percentage of the proceeds from that was being donated to Sweet Olive Farm out in Winterville, the um, animal sanctuary that's out there. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in the comments section, if, if anyone's tuning in right now, I, I left off part of my opening spiel, which is, you know, uh, you know, Jessica, this is one of 55 interviews we're doing. Our hope is that, uh, you know, our plan is that at the conclusion of this series, your interview, along with the other 54 interviews, uh, will be submitted as a digital archive to our local libraries and research institutions. And so we always exhort people at the beginning of the call or uh, the beginning of our chat that if they want to comment below, we can actually bring those comments on screen and uh, celebrate what we're seeing. One thing that I wanted to celebrate because it goes back to something you said earlier, so I see uh, Travis Birch, who you mentioned earlier. Uh, <laughs> hi, Travis. We love hi. Travis. Travis Birch is watching. Um, I see uh, it looks like Milbury Birch and Berkeley Hudson are listening. Um, yeah. But, you know, uh, when we talk about this being a family owned business, I mean, mm -hmm. you clearly have a community, a family around it. How does that change how you do business as a restaurant? Um, I specifically how how a family business makes a restaurant different yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely sure i mean there's a lot more i think of a support network an emotional support network mm -hmm. and then also maybe some more emotional drama <laughs> related yeah. to having having family um i think that i 
feel some obligation and, and sometimes guilt when things don't go the way that I'd like them to towards my family that I may not have in the same way if I had just a, a regular business partner that was just up here in the community. But I'm not sure about that because I haven't had other <laughs> other business partners. Um, but I will say that just having, having Travis's support throughout all of this, he comes in with a, a very great business background um, and he was in a family business himself. And being able to come to him for advice and guidance throughout the time that we've been open has been so wonderful. And I'm not sure if a, a regular partner would be able to offer the same amount of support and guidance without getting frustrated with me. So, yeah. Well, so I, I want to go back to you then for a second, uh, okay. with you in particular. Uh, so what can we, can you tell us about your background? So, you know, how did you find yourself in this place uh, where you're operating this restaurant? Uh, you know, how did you pick up the skills that you're using every day? Can you tell us a little bit about how you got here? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I went to UGA. I was a UGA student. I, I graduated in 2003 and I was an English major. So mm -hmm. that's how I came to Athens. <laughs> I guess a lot of us come to Athens that way and then can't leave. But um, I wasn't sure that I wanted to make a go of being a novelist, which was my plan mm -hmm. um, out of out of college. It was a um, a little bit of a lofty dream. And so I decided to take a year off, figure out what I wanted to do. And food had always been something that was really important in our family um, and it had always been a way to come together and have community. And it just made sense to me that I wanted to pursue something in food. With um, with my literature and writing background, I wanted to, I thought I wanted to become a food writer and I mm. thought that would be a pretty easy thing to do. And I was very much not right about that, but um, I went to culinary school at the Art Institute of Atlanta to try to get a background in what I would be hoping to write about. And um, while I was there, I started working at a restaurant in Smyrna called Muss and Turner's when they first mm -hmm. opened. Um, and I worked there for about two years um, under chef David Sturgis and then um, under Ryan Heidinger after that, which if anybody knows The Giving Kitchen, he's an integral part mm. of that story. But um, so I, I left there and came back to Athens in 2007. Um, David Sturgis had come to work at Farm 255, which is a farm to table restaurant that was operating here up yeah. until a few years ago. And so I, I went to work under him again there. He eventually left. I became sous chef there and started running their pastry program. And um, then I left there after about a year and a half to two years and um, was the first pastry chef at I Can Jane. Um, I didn't make donuts, but I made all the other things that they had in their pastry cases. And I worked there for, um, again, almost two years. And then I decided I was ready to open my own business. Um, whether that's true or not, I wasn't <laughs> like, the, there's been this huge learning curve. It might've been a little bit nicer to have some more managerial experience before going into it. Mm -hmm. But um, my, my dad was very supportive and was interested in getting involved in another family business with me. And so we became partners and started searching for places and ultimately found this one, started the business. So well, yeah. That's a great story. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, in a moment, I want to go back to uh, working with family because I know that that has taken on an increasing urgency and importance, especially during social distancing, when you were first figuring out how to operate with limited staff, uh, you know, uh, in the early days of COVID. Uh, yeah. I want to. I, I do want to make sure we're staying responsive to all the people that love you in the comment section. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to show. I'm going to show a few things here. So I, I see, I, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Letha or Letha uh, Kelly is watching. Uh, love heirloom and this family. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, it, it looks like you know uh, someone who got to know us through another broadcast, uh, watching uh, this video from Liberia, West Africa. Um, it looks like they've connected to historic Athens through. Uh, their relationship with Frida Scott Giles, one of our earlier interviews, and we love Dr. Giles. Um, and so uh, we're so glad that you're tuned in around the world. Um, and then I see Brenda Poss here. Uh, we love Brenda. Brenda shared, uh, our family loves heirloom, the food and drinks, the atmosphere, the location, the really fine way that they rehabbed an old structure. Thank you. Thank so you, thank Brenda. You, thank you, Brenda. <laughs> um, so, and Brenda, I want to be clear here. I haven't brought up drinks yet, but I will, because that is an important part of the heirloom 
business, including um, some really, you know, Jessica, you took some unique steps to innovate on drink during COVID. And so I want to talk about that. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, Jessica, let's talk about COVID-19. Uh, and uh, so let's, let's just go back chronologically. Can you talk about when, when did this first start affecting your business and, and how did it kind of creep into the work you were doing? Right. So I guess things started to heat up in the States while UGA was on spring break. Mm -hmm. And um, I had kind of taken a little mini vacation with my immediate family, with my husband and my kids. And we just went up to um, the mountains for a few days. And while I was there, I was like seeing the news breaking and trying to figure out what we needed to do. Um, we came back on Sunday and on Monday or on Sunday evening, I'd already, the schedules had already been made for the next week, but I just like wrote to everyone and told them that we needed to take a day off. We needed to figure out what we were doing and that I would be back in touch as quickly as possible. So we were closed on Monday the 16th and then decided on Tuesday the 17th to go um, to a to go only model. Um, and we worked with, we, we cut our staff immensely. Um, we didn't know how long this was going to last or what it was going to look like. We really have just been having to kind of be flexible this whole time. But so we went down to seven staff from 32. And, um, and we had some core people that were running things. We had one person in the kitchen at any given time and one person in front of the house. And they were, um, we did offer delivery at first. So we actually had a second person in front of the house, but we didn't have enough people take us up on that to make it worthwhile to have that person there. And mm -hmm. so we ended up with one person front and one person back. And we worked that way for several weeks, a, a couple of weeks. Time is very weird for me right now as it is mm -hmm. for most people. I think it's hard to remember it's Exactly the timeline but um we were just trying to keep things going um I filed for partial unemployment for my staff for for everyone who was working including the, the that were still working and then those that were had been laid off and I've done that every week since then um so it's it was just a, a tough thing to figure out I don't know so the to go at first really didn't take off for us um mm -hmm. We ultimately did a few like meal kit days for Mother's Day and for Easter, um, and those were really helpful. But beyond that, we just weren't really able to to make it work. But yeah. finally, we were able to to get the PPP loan from the government, and that's allowed us to be able to relax a little bit because we can pay our utilities, we can pay our rent with that, and we can pay our employees for. Um, for the time that they're working and then some, some money if they aren't able to work in addition to the unemployment benefits that they're getting. So it's hard. It's a lot to keep track of. It's really hard to know if we will get forgiven on that loan or not mm -hmm. and how that's going to look. But we are, um, we're just kind of doing the best we can. Um, when we got that, when, when I knew that that was something that was going to help us, we actually went on hiatus for a few weeks and just like took a couple of weeks off because we needed to regroup and see what was going to work. And, um, and also my brain was just fried and I needed to rest. <laughs> so we did that and, um, and came back with the Mother's Day meal kits. And then the following week we started doing to go again. And then we've gradually opened up our patio. So we are doing patio seating right now with table service. Um, and that's today is, the first day of the second week of that. So we'll see how, how that goes, but yeah. You, you know, uh, Jessica, you just walked us through the entire <laughs> process so efficiently. And yet I can't help but feel that as simple as it is to say, it was not that simple to experience. I, I mean, it, 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 must have, it must have been a lot of pressure. So one of the things we've been asking groups that you know, it, people like yourself that are leading organizations is how you navigated it personally. You know, I mean, there had to be fear and anxiety and uh, pressure and stress. And, and, and so how did you how did you navigate that from UGA spring break till now? I mean, there, there's been this like roller coaster of emotions, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if our business is going to survive this, even if we're surviving it right now. Like once mm. the PPP is dried up, will we be able to get back to where we want 
or need to be monetarily in order to be a sustainable business, I have no idea. So, I mean, it's who knows if we'll make it through this year, who knows what will happen to our staff. Like once we make that decision, if we have to make that decision and how they'll find jobs, if they have to move on, like, I I don't want to scare anybody, but it's like, we're doing the best we can to take care of our staff right now. And that's the most important thing to us, but we have to figure out, how to take care of this business in order for those people to have jobs. So it doesn't matter if we're taking care of them, if we can't employ them anymore. And so I I have a lot of feelings of like obligation and and responsibility to our staff. And that causes me a lot of anxiety all the time. (laughs) So um, more so maybe than, than anything else with this. So it's, I go through moments of like being okay. And then there's a lot of moments where I'm like, just like jittery and don't know what to do next and feel very hopeless. And then I, um, I have a lot of times where I just cry. So, so there's that, (laughs) I mean, but like there, most of the time I'm feeling okay. And I'm trying to enjoy that. I get to spend more time with my family and with my kids right now than I, um, ever really have gotten to do, which has really, really been lovely. I, um, we, we had the kids at Washika and they, which is a Montessori school and they, they shut down. They were also on spring break when, when this all happened. And so then they closed the school for an indefinite period of time. And ultimately I've decided not to do summer. Hopefully there'll be fall, but I'm not even sure what that's going to look like. But so we went from having childcare to not having childcare. And so my husband and I just split our day where he was teaching online and trying to create things. And so I would take the mornings and go into work and get everything set up for the day and all the communications done. And then I'd come home and we'd switch and he would like grade and write and do his thing. And then we have dinner together and then we go to sleep. And that's like been our, our cycle this whole time. So it's been nice to have that extra family time, but that's like, that's the positive I'm getting out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. And, and, and I mean, looking for the positive is important, but also, you know, I just want to say on behalf of the audience and, and, and the purpose of this project, I want to thank you for speaking with such candor about the the stress and anxiety you're feeling trying to take care of your team and the not only the birth family or the, the <laughs> but you know also the, the 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 restaurant family that you've established over there. Yeah. Um, a, a few quick comments here. So I see um, Aunt Janet from California's uh, tapped in. Thank you, Janet. Hi. Um, uh, I see uh, another comment from Birch here. Uh, Travis Birch and Jessica Birch. Uh, Rothger are hardworking, creative, and big-hearted people, as is Susie Birch. The restaurant reflects that. Deborah Gonzalez. Deborah, we always appreciate you tuning in. Uh, Deborah <laughs> said, I was introduced to Heirloom's ice cream sandwiches a couple years ago. Yummy. Uh, we can every- still get this. <laughs> okay, well, there we go. That's a good plug. Yeah. If it, Especially as hot as it's getting out, that's a good thing to know. Um, <laughs> can you describe... I This is very in the weeds for a second, but can you describe the ice cream sandwich? Because you do have kind of a unique take on the ice cream sandwich. Yeah, so we get our ice cream through Il Gelato, which is a wholesale um, ice cream maker that's in Watkinsville. They're a, a couple that is Italian and then moved to Argentina and then retired to Watkinsville. And they make gelato in the very traditional style. And so we buy their gelato and um, we try to have seasonal flavors. And then we make the cookies and do a nice scoop of ice cream in the middle, squish them down and um, and cut them in half and serve them to you. So right now we've got one that's a chip witch that's actually based on one of my like favorite things from when I was a little kid. <laughs> so it's it's pretty traditional chip witch where it's still house style chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, yeah. Style ice cream and then the little mini chocolate chips on the outside. And then we have one called Oh Snap that's a ginger molasses cookie and key lime gelato in the middle, which is just really very refreshing for the hot weather. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> now I'm trying to decide if I need to change my plans after this interview is over. Um, so uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I also want to say here that, um, uh, you know, we have this post here that, you know, you're big hearted people, uh, hardworking, creative as is Susie. And then the next comment was from Susie who had just, <laughs> with us, so that's good. Um, and then, um, this is a great comment that, that helps make an excellent segue. So the question says, remember you can buy gift certificates to the restaurant to support its future. Mm-hmm. You know, Jessica, I gotta tell you as someone who, I mean, Heirloom is easily one of my wife's favorite restaurants. If I need a home run date, I know that I, <laughs> we've been there for 
uh, the prefix that, you know, Valentine's Day and our last name is Valentine. So we take that pretty seriously. We've uh, been there for anniversaries and, and, and birthdays. And it's so difficult to imagine what you're saying, as true as it is, that the future is uncertain for heirloom. Mm -hmm. if, if someone is out there and they're motivated to improve the outlook on that future, uh, gift certificates is an example. What are some ways that people can support local restaurants like yours? Yeah, I mean, gift certificates are a good thing. It's kind of like a, an insurance policy almost where we, we can, um, it's like a CSA almost, like the community supported agriculture baskets where you like you mm -hmm. pay in advance for something you're going to get later, but you know you're supporting the company when they really need it. So that's a good way to do that. Um, for now, and also just getting getting to go, getting um, delivery from places that offer delivery if you're not ready to get out of your house and um, buying merchandise. We have a lot of, um, of t-shirts and we have tote bags and um, onesies and hoodies and stuff like that so that that can help support us some. And I know a lot of the other local restaurants have a lot of cool um, merchandise that you can get as well and satisfactory has been really great where they yeah. set up a bunch of um of different options for re restaurants or any business to do these fundraising campaigns with their their merch you guys are doing one of those right you that's right a, a yeah. Athens you, that's right but i we love our shirts and i'll actually i'm going to show an image of them in a little bit <laughs> but y'all uh, satisfactory has been so great and i've seen so many cute shirts yeah, y'all had the ones with the cute tomatoes, and yeah. those may have been the cutest shirts I saw. Uh, satisfactory start to print. So yeah, they're was... pretty adorable. We have still some of the tote bags and the toddler shirts in those, so we don't have any adult shirts anymore. But we might get some of those printed just for later. So okay. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I shared uh, shared the Heirloom Athens page on the screen here. Folks can also visit it in the comments section if they want to find out how to contact you or support. I know that you mentioned that. You all have started rolling out uh, dine-in service, kind of socially distanced dine-in service. You right. are you are on my running route every day, and so I always I every time I run by and there are people, I'm happy. Every time I run by and it's dark, I get worried. So um, <laughs> I, I know that uh, it must feel, even though you're having to take a lot of precautions to keep people safe, it, it must feel pretty good to see people on your patio. Is that right? I mean, it, it is, it does feel good to see people on the patio because that's what we got into this business to do is to help people be able to dine together and, and come together in community. But we have, I mean, we've been serving food to go this whole time, but it's not the same, you know, yeah. it's not the same experience for the diner. It's not the same experience for us to get to see how it makes people happy. And it just doesn't feel the same, but, right. um, but I want people to be safe. I certainly want them to be safe and it is a little bit nerve wracking to know that there are people sitting on our patio that are not wearing masks and they're eating and, right. and what that could potentially cause in the restaurant. But at the same time, I, I just hope that they're all taking as many precautions as possible when they're not sitting there unmasked right. and eating so that they are safe and we're safe. Um, but there's no real way to know besides just asking them if they have had any symptoms and and beyond that, that right. you know, it's just a scary time. It, it's a scary time. And it's one where there's so, I, you know, I actually, Alex, Sam's, uh, once again, Alex, we're glad that you're tuning in with us. And Alex just shared, you know, business ownership is uncertain on its best day. So you're talking about crazy times, Jessica, it's always crazy times if you're running a, an operation like this, you know, add moments like this. And it's amazing that owners can stay focused and forward moving. So, um, Jessica, I want to ask a question on that remaining focus thing. So I was just thinking as I was describing running by the restaurant that I think the last time I set on eyes on you and your family in person was also running by coincidence right as this was starting. I think it was before all the Athens parks got closed Right. Uh, during the week of spring break. If I'm remembering correctly, I think I went for a long run in Sandy Creek, uh, not the nature center, Sandy Creek Park. Right. And I yeah. think I ran by you guys on the playground, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so tying that to Alex's question, to remain focused, I'm sure that you're having to find outlets where you can spend time with family, where you can get out. But places like the place I saw you aren't open. So, right. you know, what are some of the habits and outlets your family has developed 
so that you can remain focused when it's time to work. Right. Um, as we really like to get outside a lot, so you saw us outside. Somewhere, but um, so Sandy Creek Park was closed, and, and they are open again now. But right. unfortunately, the well, fortunately, the playground and the beach are not open, right. which is why we would take our kids there was to play and and get to go on the beach. And we were there on a play date when we happened right. to see you. Um, and we we have been utilizing the state parks um, a little bit. Oh. We we go out to Watson's Mill pretty often and find a kind of secluded area along the river. And Fox, my my toddler, he's three. He likes to throw rocks in water. That's one of his favorite activities. So we find a pile of rocks and let him go to town there and just like h- hike around on the trails that they have. Um, we went over to Fort Yargo this past weekend and did the little nature trail there with Fox and he got to ride. It's, it's paved. So he rode on his little scooter around there and he really liked that. Um, so we take walks in our neighborhood. Our street is just one, we don't have a neighborhood per se. It's just one street that does a loop. And so we just go around and around and around in circles Mm. and we've gotten to know our neighbors at a social distance more than we ever had. We've only lived there for about a year and a half or here for about a year and a half now in this house. So we've gotten to see them. Um, I mean, beyond that, I've done a lot of like house projects. I started doing some container gardening. I'm not I'm not a gardener, but I'm, I'm going to be. So I, before I put things in, in the ground, I'm putting them in containers and seeing if I can keep them alive. Um, yeah. And then doing a lot of reading. And yeah, so that that's that's the ways that I'm trying to like chill out on my own and like focus my brain and be able to. I've been cooking a lot and baking a lot. Actually, baking is, is a big thing that I can do with my son. Cause he, he pours ingredients into a bowl, but he, he yeah. doesn't do a lot more than that. Sometimes he stirs things, but he really likes pulling his stool up and baking with me. So, you know, yeah. I, I have to share. Um, uh, I, I, I want to take a moment to thank our annual sponsors, heirloom being one of those. And so I'm going to do that when we come back and everyone stick with us, I want to talk about that exact subject because I want to talk about uh, baking. I know that uh, before we went on air, I talked about how you published a recipe online that I think people should see, which is your brownie recipe. Um, And then also I want to talk about cooking with your kids because that has been something that's popped up for us. Uh, You know, our, our two and a half year old now knows how to stir and put things (laughs) in a bowl. So, uh, so we'll talk about that. Uh, Jessica, stay with us. Don't go anywhere. Uh, audience, stay with us. This only takes about 90 seconds or so, but we are going to thank our annual sponsors as we should. So um, uh, very briefly. Uh, so first of all, as we mentioned, uh, this week's live cast is brought to you by Karen and Norman Baldwin. Uh, we want to thank the Baldwin so much for supporting this effort to explore and document this unique moment in history. Um, the logos and names you see on the screen above these are our annual sponsors. These are the folks that support us keeping our lights on and our team employed year round. They support our work to celebrate and conserve community heritage here in Athens, Georgia. And so if you see a business name on there that you're familiar with, uh, please support them. Please give them their business. Uh, that money is going directly back to supporting historic work here in Athens, Georgia. And that definitely includes Heirloom, who has tirelessly supported us in so many ways, uh, financially, food, um, networking, community building. uh, We really appreciate them. If you'd like to become a sponsor or a member, you can do so for as little as $5 a month um, at historicathens.com. And so we definitely want to encourage folks to consider that. I know we mentioned t-shirts. Ours don't have cute tomatoes on them, uh, but they are still cute. And uh, we have three celebrating different parts of Athens history. You can find them at historicathens.com, including one that includes the turf that Heirloom is in. There's a boulevard shirt. Uh, So we encourage folks to check that out. Uh, We also want you to know that if you're watching this and you are looking for an internship in the Athens area, we are offering internships now. You can apply at uh, just email Tommy at historicathens.com or give me a call at 706-296-3583. This image was published on our Facebook page today. Um, We love our interns. We have typically nine to 16 a semester. We are an experiential learning approved site and we would love to involve you as an intern and, and, and have you part of the process of running this organization. Uh, and then one last thing I'm just gonna flash up here. We're proud of our live casts. Uh, we encourage you at two o'clock when this is over to head over to the Facebook page for the Athens Welcome Center. 
um, and see their live casts that they're doing each day at two. Uh, you know, we operate the Athens Welcome Center and we're really proud of that. And here's the list of our interviewees for this live cast. You can see Jessica's name on there. There's also a scrollable version on our Facebook page of this list. And you can see all kinds of entrepreneurs, community leaders, elected officials and whatnot on here uh, that we're thrilled to talk to. We appreciate all the sponsors you see below. And we hope that you keep tuning in every weekday at one o'clock through June 26th. Uh, so, uh, all right, Jessica. So, uh, hi, uh, long time to see you, Jessica. Um, so, uh, thanks for letting us thank other folks and you uh, for your support. So let's talk about cooking in the kitchen, you know. Um, I was in third grade, I think, the first time I made a cake. You know, my parents gradually taught me to cook, and I think I made it for either my mother's birthday or Mother's Day. As soon as I find, found out I was going to have a kid, I immediately thought, how how soon can I get her in the kitchen with me cooking and baking? And we've done a lot of that over uh, the quarantine, and including, you know, uh, I think she sprinkled the chocolate chips in the recipe that we did for you. Uh, she helped she helped make a few cakes, um, things like that. Um, how has baking and cooking with your child been part of your self care? Um, well, we make a lot of cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fox is really into the show Pete the Cat, and they make blueberry cupcakes in one episode, and that was kind of where it started. And we mm -hmm. also um, got a book for Christmas that's a a little bit of a tutorial on how to make cupcakes um, for but it's a children's picture book. Mm -hmm. And so he, he talks about making cupcakes a lot. And basically anytime I start to make something in the kitchen, he's like, we're making cupcakes. Are we making cupcakes? <laughs> and he'll come and pull his little stool up. And um, so it's been something that we have really enjoyed together. We'll make it. Um, we'll, he'll sit in front of the oven and watch things baking in there and how they're rising. Mm -hmm. And then um, we let them cool and he gets to have like one small piece because he's doing yeah. and he doesn't need all that sugar. And, and maybe the next day he has another piece. But with so many baked goods in my house, I've actually had to um, get rid of some of it. So <laughs> I, I box them up and we've shared with our neighbors. We've shared with other staff members at Heirloom. And I've taken some to my parents. <laughs> like I just, yes. For every every baking recipe that we have, which is at least once a week, if not sometimes twice, I have to give half of it away to someone because I cannot keep that in my house. <laughs> I, I, I can very much relate. I bring it over to my parents' house and then they say, you should take this home with you. And I I say absolutely not. <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't need the temptation. Um, so, uh, so Jessica, uh, what I'd like to do is we still have about fifteen minutes together. I'd like to make sure we touch on three questions we've been asking each of our guests, mm -hmm. and then if we have additional time, I want to delve more into heirloom together. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, the first question is restaurant related, or, or at least Athens related. Uh, we've been asking each of our guests to imagine the following, which is. You know, if you woke up tomorrow, uh, let's say vaccine had been distributed tonight, it was safe to go out, uh, you didn't have to shelter in place anymore. And this is probably the hardest one for you to imagine, Jessica, if you imagine you ha actually had the day off uh -huh. um, and could go in everywhere, how would you spend your day? What are the Athens places you miss? Well, if we're thinking food-centered stuff, <laughs> Um, I would probably go with my family to Little City Diner for breakfast mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and have breakfast there and then go over to Petard Park in Winterville and um, let Fox play on the playground. And now that Soren is my baby, well, he's like, he just turned one. I keep mm -hmm. thinking of him as a baby, but I guess he's a toddler now. But he just started being able to like pull up on things and he can like walk around holding on to stuff, but he's never played on a playground before, you know? So like oh, wow. for, so getting them to both be able to play on the playground um and then i i don't know coming back and hanging out in our own yard for a little while but then maybe in the afternoon going and um having a little bit of a, a a lunch date perhaps with my mom at the national and sit at the bar and really enjoy their their power lunch there that they have yeah, yeah. their fantastic salads i i just really love the national and it usually is my special occasion place although right now i think being able to go out to eat is a special occasion and right. so anytime is a special occasion there um 
I think another thing that I would really love to do is to go to Memorial Park with my kids and feed the ducks there and play on the playground and then go to um, Condor and have a milkshake afterwards. That's another special and fun thing that we really like to do together. So those are some day off treats <laughs> out there. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with a lot of those. I The other day I was working during the day, but uh, Laura, my wife, was able to take our daughter out to Memorial to introduce her to the ducks. So um, <laughs> and uh, uh, she's tried to go back out since then, but now everyone's realized the park is open and it's just impossible. Right. But uh, I love the photos of, of Nora seeing the ducks. I'm sure that Fox would uh, love yeah. the ducks. Yeah, he the ducks. really loves feeding those ducks. <laughs> Sometimes he's just throwing things directly at them, <laughs> but not things like duck food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the ducks aren't mad as long as they can eat it. Um, so, uh, which, you know, I mean, that's one of the things about Athens uh, is, you know, I fed those ducks when I was a kid. You know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a community that we like to be out and about in and share those with our kids. And it's hard not to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, Jessica, my next question of the three concerns historic places like your restaurant. Uh -huh. uh, when we come out of this, it's likely we'll not only be coming out of a pandemic, we also will likely, hopefully, be coming out of a recession. And post-recession, there's usually a lot of pent up development pressure and it can spill out quickly and endanger historic places. And so we've been asking each of our guests just to name some of their favorite historic places, uh, you know, places that they treasure, that they hope, you know, maybe places that you enjoy going with your family, yeah. but places that you hope our community continues to preserve. Um, are there anything, is, is there anything like that that comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I really love Boulevard, the, the street itself and the, how it's nice and wide and has the beautiful trees that, that arch over the middle of the street. And it's just such a peaceful place to walk up and down the street there and all those beautiful homes that have been so lovingly restored. And um, they're just so gorgeous. I That's my my favorite street in Athens. So I'm very lucky to get to be on it most of the time. Right. Um, another street I really love is University Drive off of the Millage. Um, I, I like to go walking around there at Christmas time. The Christmas lights are always so beautiful and those houses are just so lovely. And it's when I'm driving around in that area, I often will make a detour just to get to drive down that road because I think it's so pretty. Um, as far as more well, I also re I really love, I guess it's, they're called the park at Five Points now. There's apartments that where condo, Condor Chocolates is and um, Donna Ching's mm -hmm. that have been renovated recently. But I've always thought they were such cool places. Like I just, I've never actually been inside of one of them, but I've always imagined how cool they must be on the inside. And I'd love to see a before and after set of pictures of, of how they looked before the, the renovation inside and what they yeah, look yeah. like now. Um, and then the Georgian downtown that I guess it used to be a hotel and now it's yeah. apartments. I think that's like a very special place that I um I remember when Trump's catering used to have the like the main ballroom there. I went to a couple of events and just like the windows and the way the light comes in and the kind of I, I'm not as good with all of the historic terms, but I feel like it's got kind of an art deco y vibe to it, which I, I like. And um so that that's another place that I think is really cool and really special and then I really like the building where you guys are the fire hall number two is one of my favorite places in Athens I've had several events in the um the event space there down below you guys and then just that whole building where Avid was and where um where the salon is is just a really it's a cool spot too so well I definitely don't object to you in <laughs> the fire hall I, I also will say you know uh Several of the places you named, you know, we have a relationship with. We did a members uh, only event, kind of a pop-up preservation uh, some years ago at the Styles uh, apartment buildings in Five that's Points, where you mentioned. And I know that people love that. Maybe that's something we'll have to repeat to get people in there. Um, and then also, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the uh, Georgian. That's actually a place we have a uh, historic easement on, and we've worked with them. And it's such a cool place. One thing I love sharing with people, because I know we all, everyone in Athens loves cool Athens history facts, is the elevator in by the ballroom you mentioned, Jessica, was one of the first elevators in this region of Georgia, oh. enough that it was a tourist attraction for a while. People, <laughs> people would come to look at the elevator. Um, so it is, it, 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 you, those are definitely unique pieces of history you've highlighted. Yeah. Um, my last question, that I have planned and we'll see where things go 
is is a broad one. You know, as we mentioned earlier in the program, this interview will be part of a digital archive that'll be accessible for future generations to in case they want to research what things were like during this era. And I'm I'm curious, you know, if if somebody's watching this a hundred years from now, Jessica, what would you want them to know about this moment in Athens history? Um I mean, the main thing is just that there's so many people that are struggling, but we're all just doing the best we can to take care of ourselves and take care of every, everyone around us. And often that's looking like not being with our loved ones, which is mm. really difficult. But um, just n knowing that we're all doing the best we can, that we've been really lucky with the leadership that we've had in athens Clark County being kind of before a lot of the rest of the the state and the country and trying to get everybody to be as careful as possible and, and do shelter in place and do social distancing. And I, I think that that's paid off for us, although it's possible that now that things have started opening up in Georgia, that it's returning to something pretty scary. But I feel, I feel like just knowing that everybody is handling this differently and they're all just doing the best they can is the main thing mm. I can take away from it. So no, I mean, that's a great takeaway with the time that we have left. I see we have about seven minutes or so. Okay. I, I want to touch on something that's popped up a few times in our conversation, which is this idea of reopening. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, historically folks are going to wonder how people felt about it. And you, you alluded to earlier that it's a bit of a paradox for you because you want to keep yourself safe. You have family you're trying to keep safe, uh, folks of different ages and vulnerabilities. You also have your staff that you care about deeply. Uh, and then, you know, there's the idea that it complicates things when things reopen because you might have different liabilities. You have this PPP loan that cert puts certain pressure on the size of your team. Um, and so can you, can you walk us through the pressure cooker of, of that feeling of, of, of wanting to keep people safe, but also needing to reopen and, and, and how that feels? Yeah, I mean, right now we can only do about a third of the, like we can only do about a third of the business of what we were doing before. Um, and I, I don't know when we're gonna be able to have inside dining at the restaurant. Um, we have a pretty small space. And so in order to, keep tables six feet apart and in order to limit the number of guests per square footage that we have to do, we can really only have, we can have actually like fewer people in our dining room than we can on the patio because of the, the six feet apart part of it and the way that things are configured. And I, I've seen some of the diagrams of, I guess, a restaurant in, in China where there was one asymptomatic person and because of the air conditioning ducts, nine right. people were infected from that one person and none of them had any idea that anyone in the room was infected. And it's just so scary to me and the idea of being liable for that happening. Not liable, I mean, liable monetarily is one thing, but like just like the guilt that I would feel if that right. happened because I let people come and dine in my restaurant. Um, I would just feel so awful if someone got very sick or were to die because I was wanting to open up too quickly. And so I just have no idea when that's going to be possible to do for for us. But right now we're hoping that the outside dining at least allows any anyone who is asymptomatic that things di dissipate and like float off into the air instead of staying in our space. But it's just, it's really scary. Like my parents are, so my dad is in his early seventies. Um, and so is my mom and my mom had a heart surgery last year and wow. she's recovered really well from that. But like, I'm just very concerned about them being high risk and, um, and my, my dad exposing himself to something and then him exposing her. And then, I mean, I, I just don't even want to think about what could happen and how bad I would feel if that were to happen. So my dad was one of the first people that I laid off just because I was like, look, you have to, you have to take care of yourself. You have to socially distance. I'm not going to, I mean, you, you are one thing, but like, I don't want to expose my mom who's like super high risk at this point. Right. You know? um, so I just, we have to be able to make money in order to stay open. But I also like you, 
you have to know that you're doing everything you can to keep people safe if you're going to move forward. Like, so it's, it is a paradox. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and thanks for exploring that once again, so candidly, you know, uh, of what I've gotten to know, both your parents, uh, including Travis, you know, sits as a trustee for our organization. Uh, I can't imagine asking either of them to stop working. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, but, uh, but, you know, that's a, it's a complex and frightful decision that folks are making. I know that the folks our age, uh, you know, I mean, I'm having to decide I have two sets of local grandparents. When yeah. do we see them? What do we ask of them to be able to see them? You know, those kind of things. Um, I, I promised earlier, I promised Brenda that before we got off air, I'd bring up drinks, you know, because you brought oh, up yes. drinks. Um, you know, Heirloom <laughs> is, uh, uh, in my mind, pretty famous for their cocktails and their drinks. You have a great bar menu. Um, I know that's one of the attractions of brunch. Uh, you've had to look at some interesting innovations when it comes to drinks. Uh, can you talk about that? So um, our our general manager, Daniel Ray, has put together a few cocktails that we can do to go in batches. So we're, we have bottles that we're doing two cocktails in one bottle and selling those to go. We have um, some seasonal things. We have one with rhubarb and bourbon that's really delicious. We have a, a blueberry one um, that has lavender that's really yummy. And um, then we've got some of our oak aged um cocktails as well, a Negroni and a Boulevardier that both are aged in an oak barrel. And then we we make them in batches anyways to age them. So it just makes sense that they translate to being in bottles. Yeah. And so we've been selling those in bottles. Um, we are also doing bottles of wine at pretty, pretty great deals for a restaurant bottle of wine. And then um, we're also doing... Um, Sorry, <laughs> I got a text message. I didn't know if you could see that pop up. On no, the no, I didn't. Okay, but um, we're also doing beers to go. Um, unfortunately, we can't sell them for what like you can buy them at, at the liquor store for. Yeah. But if somebody wanted to get two beers to go with the dinner that they're having, um, we've been able to do that. And we've heard from um, from Kelly Gertz that we would be able to do that as long as the social distance requirements are in effect and we're in a local state of emergency that we'll still be able to sell alcohol to go. So that's, Great. that's been a new adventure for us <laughs> to be able to do that. So, well, I, I want to say every word you said there was important, but it was hard for me to pay attention once you said rhubarb and bourbon. So, yeah. uh, I, uh, uh, We'll just have to consider what, as I said, when you were talking about the ice cream sandwiches, I have to make some important decisions about what the rest of my day looks like. Yeah. Um, but uh, but Jessica, I, I'm going to close by sharing uh, this note uh, from Alex. Uh, uh, the Heirloom Building is a great example of repurposing a building in a historic neighborhood into another use, gas station to restaurant, uh, better for the whole community than a complete demo and putting up a new building. Thank you and uh, Jimmy W for your vision. Um, you know, uh, Jessica, one of the, the nice freedoms of the fact that I am not a journalist, I am a nonprofit executive director conducting this interview, is yeah. I get to editorialize just a bit. And I yeah. want to say that, you know, certainly we agree with Alex. We agree with a lot of the comments that have popped up today. You know, heirlooms are real treasure and we can't imagine Athens without it. And so uh, we want to encourage people reviewing, please support heirloom, please support restaurants like heirloom that are uh, committed to the community and that are uh, supporting the community with their dollars and who are trying to get through this by, you know, building some curbside uh, uh, purchases or careful dining experiences to your uh, week. So, uh, uh, Jessica, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. Of course, it's been very wonderful for us. So uh, thanks, everyone, who tuned in. We will be back tomorrow at 1 p.m. We hope that you'll join us. Uh, if you want to see past interviews, go to the video section of our Facebook page. Jessica, you and I are going to log off real quick, so stay with me. Uh, but everyone else, thank you so much. Stay safe, stay healthy, buy local, and we'll see you at 1 o'clock tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Have a great Bye. day.